Hi everyone. If you watched this channel, you recently saw that I repaired this Hewlett Packard 8664A signal generator. The instrument has been working well since the repair, but there are several things that I wanted to go over before the top cover is on and everything is buttoned up. So in part one, we saw the output frequency could meet the 10 millihertz resolution, but only after the option one high stability time base was correctly connected. So initially, the rear panel coax jumper was missing, disabling the high stability time base and defaulting back to the standard time base. Although the main output signal looked okay at first, as we saw in part two, I started to notice some instability and the HF driver module failed at self-test. Also, two fault indicators were turning on at certain frequencies and the HF driver module did not calibrate correctly. So there were definitely some issues going on. The problem was traced to poor connections on the very small conductive foam pads linking the hybrid modules to the circuit board inside the HF driver module. So basically the foam had become compressed and without pressure, the pads don't touch the gold traces enough to make a reliable connection. A perhaps unusual solution that worked out very well was to use minuscule snips of paper to shim the foam pads and restore pressure, thereby making the pads contact properly to the gold traces on the hybrid circuits and the circuit board. So in part two, I mentioned the HF driver calibration dialed in within eight millivolts of the cal sticker value after the repair, but it should actually be seven millivolts or better. So after some more careful adjustments and cycling the instrument power, the value has settled to within three millivolts. So I'm very happy with that result. So taking a look at this setting right here, if we go to the special menu and then you do special 301, so that's the module, and which it shows module 10. And that's the HF driver module that it's going to take the measurement. And then if we go to special and 304, so MUX seven or multiplex number seven is the test point that we need to take the calibration reading at. And I know it's MUX seven because of the uh, service manual and the information that was given there. They say to use test point number seven. And if we go to special 306 and turn that on. So there's the built-in voltmeter and it's already in the DC voltage mode because it can of course measure AC voltage as well. So we're measuring 1.843 volts and that's within three millivolts of that Cal sticker. So spot on, looks excellent. And it's been very, very stable now for many days of use. So I'm very happy with that result. So just set this back to frequency again. And the frequency has to be at 100 megahertz and minus 10 dBm for the output signal level when you take that voltage reading. Okay, so this signal generator has the original firmware version of 360, and that's the initial release. And I wanted to update the firmware, and the latest version that I was able to find is version 421. So let me grab this chart right here, and we can see right here. So again, on this chart, we're up here in 360, and you can see original release of the firmware. And down here, 421 is the version that I was able to find. And as it goes along on this chart, you can see some changes that were made right here. So, you know, these are rather important things that were corrected and fixed. So I'd like to be able to incorporate that into this instrument. So there is a version 422, but it really looks like the only change there was that it corrects the HF driver instrument level diagnostics errors and uh, I was not able to find that version of the firmware, but again, uh, 421, I'm going to install that. So uh, that'll take care of some of these other changes that were done. Now right here is the firmware. So on these four ROMs right here. So it's a matter of unplugging the old chips and just plugging these in. So I'll get the main controller board removed and I'll show you the old chips that are on that board. And then I'll just get these replaced and they're in sockets. So there's no soldering or anything like that. Very easy to change them out. All right, so this is a control board along the edge right here. So it just plugs in and lifts straight out. I have to remove this coax cable as well. Now, normally this section right here is covered by this metal shield. So this fits in here like so. And of course this metal shield to be able to remove it these two coax cables would have to be removed as well. But I already had this metal shield taken out because of the other work that was being done on the instrument. Now take a look right here, these four switches right there. Notice the first switch is to the outside direction of the instrument and the other three switches are that direction. 
So to access those 300 level service menus, so the 306 and the 304, and there are many other service menus as well, but to access anything in that 300 level, this first switch needs to be this outside direction. So keep that in mind if you're working on one of these instruments and you need to get to those service menus. All right, control board removed, and I'll get these ROMs moved over to these locations. And of course, I'll save the old ROMs because the instrument certainly does work using them, so it makes a safety backup. And right here, you can see on the board, it says U31, U32, U33, and U34. So those locations that are silk screened on are also marked on these tags right there that are on top of the ROMs. So of course, it does matter which position each of the chips is installed. All right, the control board is reinstalled. So let me grab the power cord here and plug this in. Right there. And reach around the other side and let's see what happens. Here we go. All right, perfect. Revision 421. Excellent. So it should go into the self calibration routine. Give it a moment here to start up. Yes, there it goes. So calibrating. And it says oven because the oven has cooled a little bit and that indicator will go off and we'll take a look at the messages and uh, it should just basically say that the user memory was cleared. There shouldn't be any other error messages if everything's working correctly. So the calibration routine takes a little bit of time, so we'll continue on once that's complete. And the reason that it has to recalibrate is because the memory holdup battery is on that control board, but the calibration EEPROM is separate and it's on a different location. So when you remove the control board, the battery goes with it and it breaks that you know, the backup power that's going to the calibration uh, EEPROM. So anyway, here it goes on the calibration. Let's see what happens. All right, the calibration routine has finished, and this is the display that came up. So it just says message. So if we go right here to message, yep, user memory cleared. That's normal. Message queue empty. Perfect. No error messages. Everything is looking spot on. So it looks like the firmware is upgraded with no problems. So to take full advantage of the precise 10 millihertz resolution accuracy that this signal generator has, I wanted the ovenized crystal oscillator, which is option one, to be as accurate as possible. So after the part two video, I had noticed that the frequency was not exactly at 10 megahertz coming out of that time base oscillator. It was a few millihertz off, but that's too much. So I adjusted the time base oscillator after waiting for about a six hour warm up period, and then I've monitored the frequency over the next several days. I just left the signal generator running continuously, and it's remaining very, very stable and sitting right at 10 megahertz now. So I'm comparing against a GPS disciplined oscillator that has a 100 microhertz resolution. So let's go over to the oscilloscope and I'll show you the result. So right now I'm gonna just take this adapter off. It's a little dummy load. SMA connector right there on the end, 50 ohm dummy load. And in that place, I'm going to put this BNC adapter right there. Connect the cable. And you can take a measurement on the rear panel on the 10 megahertz output, or we can use the front panel right here, and I'll just go to frequency 10 megahertz. And then right here, we'll go amplitude, set this to zero uh, dBm. Okay, let's go over to the oscilloscope and I'll show you the result of that adjustment. All right, so let's take a look at the result of adjusting the time base oscillator's frequency. I'll also show you how you can make a very precise frequency adjustment using the oscilloscope when you have a stable reference frequency to compare to. So you can see that there's two waveforms being displayed, essentially one cycle worth of each sine wave. So the sine wave that has a slightly lower amplitude is coming from the signal generator, and the sine wave with a slightly higher amplitude is coming from the GPS disciplined oscillator. You can see on the oscilloscope that both channel inputs are going through a 50 ohm feed through termination. So it's always a good idea to terminate the coax into 50 ohms, especially when you're working with frequencies like 10 megahertz. If you don't, you can end up with uh, reflections on the coax and it'll cause distortion on the sine waves. It's maybe not a stable waveform. Also, the signal generator is meant to work into 50 ohms as well as the GPS disciplined oscillator. So again, you want that termination of 50 ohms. So again, you can see that the sine waves are very stable with relation to each other. Now, the GPS disciplined oscillator is on channel one and that's the triggered channel. So that won't be changing at all. That's this sine wave right here. It goes right through the center of the graticules. 
So the other waveform from the signal generator, again, it's not drifting with relation to the uh, GPS disciplined oscillator. And what does that tell us? Well, it means that both signals are exactly the same frequency. So if I go over to the signal generator, I'm going to increase by, I'll go up 20 millihertz. Okay, so it's 10 megahertz and then I increased it by 20 millihertz. So very, very small increase. But look at that. Now the signal generator's waveform is drifting just a little bit to the left. So now, you know, you can see that the waveforms are changing re with relation to each other and you know that the, the frequencies are not exactly the same. So when I was adjusting the time base oscillator, initially it was moving a little bit faster than that even, so it was uh, you know, a few tens of millihertz off. And with the uh, signal generator having such precise control on the output, down to just 10 millihertz steps, you know, that kind of resolution is basically pointless if the time base oscillator is drifting and not exactly where it's supposed to be because then the displayed frequency on the uh, signal generator isn't really what's coming out of the signal generator. So again, if I go down, that's, that's 10 megahertz and very stable again, not changing. And when you do a test like this and this adjustment, you can only make this as stable as the reference frequency. So in this case, it's the GPS disciplined oscillator and that's accurate and stable down to a 100 microhertz resolution. So very, very accurate waveform and very, very accurate uh, frequency. So the adjustment that you're making is, you know, in relation to that is only going to be as accurate as that reference frequency. So just keep that in mind. But if I lower the frequency down, so I'll go to, uh, 10 megahertz, uh, I went down 20 millihertz below. And now you can see when it's lower in frequency, it's drifting the other way. And if I I'll increase back up now by 10 millihertz and, uh, excuse me, that went down by 10 millihertz. Let me go back up again here. Okay, so that's 10 megahertz and then down by just uh, 10 millihertz. So just drifting just a little bit. So it doesn't take much to make a, a visual change. If I go right exactly back up right there to 10 megahertz. Very, very stable again. And if I go just 10 millihertz above, if you watch, it'll start to drift just a little bit that way. Okay, that's right back to 10 megahertz again, and very stable. So very happy with the result. It's work, the uh, signal generator is working very well. All right, so it looks like the HP 8664A signal generator project is about wrapped up. There's a few minor pieces of hardware that I need to reinstall. I need to get the top cover put back on, and then I need to find a place on the workbench. This signal generator is quite large, so I'm gonna have to rearrange a few pieces of equipment, but definitely looking forward to using the signal generator and very happy how it turned out. So if you enjoyed this video, you can let me know by giving it a thumbs up. And if you're enjoying the content on this channel, don't forget to subscribe. There'll be many more videos coming up in the near future. In fact, I have another piece of HP equipment that needs some repairs and servicing, and that'll be coming up very, very soon. All right, as always, thank you for taking time to watch. And until next time, take care. Goodbye for now.